to lend my support to the mover of the bill and to share with the public how your financial resources will be used in 2023, especially as it relates to the ministries that fall under my portfolio. As I consider my ministries, Madam Speaker, I must admit that I find myself at times jokingly when asked, what am I the minister of? Poetically responding that I am the minister of health. And I say this because as the minister of agriculture, fisheries, et al., I find myself responsible for the nutritional well-being of our nation. And as a minister responsible for sports, again, I find myself responsible for the physical well-being of our nation. And as a minister responsible for the creative economy, I find myself here responsible for the psychological, emotional, and cultural well-being of our nation. And as a minister responsible for small business and entrepreneurship, recognizing that the MSME sector is a driving force of every economy. Again, I find myself responsible for the economic health of our nation. So, poetically, I guess I'm the Minister of Health. <laughs> but Madam Speaker, today, I'm here to speak less to the poetic side of this matter, but more to the actual practical side of the matter. And on the practical side of this matter, Madam Speaker, we can all agree that these are extremely important areas, especially when placed in the context of transforming our nation into a sustainable small island state. Madam Speaker, when one considers the impact that these ministries have on our youth, our young people, who are the future of this nation, who, may I put on record here, represent the largest age demographic within our nation. Then we realize that whatever is done within these ministries, Madam Speaker, will significantly impact our nation for years to come. So in that regard, the format of my presentation, therefore, will be to share the vision of how these ministries will attempt to bring about the goal of developing a sustainable island state while we are our resilience and external contributors and set while we are our resilience and external contributors and sectors is significantly reduced and we our people thrive and become more self sustaining. But before I dive directly into my presentation, Madam Speaker, allow me first to say what a privilege it is to have been meeting and working with the staff of my various ministries. Over the past four months, I've had a chance to interact with so many. And there is incredible work being done that so much of our public is oblivious to. But I have made it clear to all their departments that they must integrate visibility plans. Integrate these into their work process with a view to making the information about the services and activities of the departments more available to the public. Allow me also to speak, Madam Speaker, to my ob observation of how much lack exists in our societies. A lack of awareness, lack of life-changing opportunities, lack of exposure to improve and advanced methods, and, and Madam Speaker, how necessary it is for government to be more persistent and even aggressive about filling these gaps and addressing these problems. Madam Speaker, I now wish to turn our attention squarely to the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Marine Resources. In this ministry, Madam Speaker, our goal is of course to ensure that we bring food and nutrition security to our nation. We want our people not only to have more locally produced food, Madam Speaker, but to ensure that this food is of the highest nutritional and quality standards. And in that regard, Madam Speaker, we have adopted 
a more measurable goal. A goal that we have not adopted alone. For as members of CARICOM, we have bought into the 25 by 25 agenda. We, are, we have agreed across CARICOM to invest in our people that they, more they may more adequately be able to participate in reducing our food import bill by 25% by the year 2025. In St. Kitts and Nevis, that means cutting the approximate $140 million annual food import bill by 25%, which is some $35 million per year. So you see, Madam Speaker, the money that we invest into the Ministry of Agriculture et al will be in some way directly affecting or encouraging and enhancing our people's ability to target that $35 million annually. And to this end, the budget for 2023, which stands at $25,143,820, is designed to ensure that St. and Nevis will be part of CARICOM's conversation when they speak to the successes of the 25 by 25 agenda. And as your Minister of Agriculture, I stand committed to ensure that when that conversation is had, that St. Kitts and Nevis will be a glowing example. And now, I am here, Madam Speaker, really to ensure that we put aside all political talk and ensure that this is an action item, a real action item. Because for far too long, we've heard the talk about supporting agriculture. We've heard the talk about investing in agriculture. But somehow, in reality, we have yet to see true, meaningful results. And so, Madam Speaker, I don't know if it's because I'm a farmer myself, or my deep-seated love and passion for the area, but I do believe that we are now ready for an agricultural revolution. We are now ready for transformation. And as I say that, I don't say it lightly. What I hold here in my hand reads St. Kitts and Nevis Agricultural Transformation and Growth Strategy for the year 2022 to 2020. 31. While campaigning, I committed that within six months, we will have a strategy for agriculture. I am sure we all agree that we are here some four months, and this is a draft of that strategy. So Madam Speaker, it's not just talk. We are here for action. So, Madam Speaker, as we talk about agriculture, allow me to delve a bit into the Department of Fisheries and Marine Resources. We are, our budget speaks to significant upgrades in particular areas. And we've heard our Honorable Prime Minister and move of the bill speak to some of the plans um, for our fisheries sector, in particular he spoke about some of the plans for DAPE. And I see a proud representative of that area in our senator to my right. <laughs> As it relates to DAPE, Madam Speaker, we see that there's a capital project that would assist in the increase in the number of jetties at Deer Bay, which would then allow for our fisher folk at Deer Bay to be able to land their boat and their cats safely, rather than having to somehow try to have their boat anchored out at sea, they now can pull up more readily against jetty. This will 
increase, not just the passion of our fishermen, Madam Speaker, but the ability of our fishermen to know that when I come in with my catch, that the utilities and services provided would allow for me to readily be able to take that catch onto shore and meet the awaiting public and market in the best way possible. And so I said to the people of the Bay, transformation is coming. Development is coming. Along with that, Madam Speaker, we are also ensuring that there will be ice. Yes. Ice. ice. For far too long, this has been a simple but daunting problem for our fisher folk. Ice. We've seen that issue across the board. Vast fisheries. Deep fisheries. And not to speak about the fisheries complex in my own constituency in Old Road. We are for far too long a simple matter of ice has been a major issue. And so, we have also budgeted for the investment in ice. Not just in the Bastille, Old Road, or Deadly Fisheries, but to ensure that there's ice even close by in the event of a failure. So the fig tree fisheries as well will have ice, <laughs> Madam Speaker. And as we go on, I want to ensure the people of the constituency that place me here, constituency number four, that the old road fisheries will have ice again in abundance in 2023. We have already begun the process, Madam Speaker, of ensuring that that ice machine will be up and running fully in 2023 and that redundancies are put in place just in case that ice machine happens to go bad ever again. So you see, transformation is indeed coming in agriculture. Transformation is coming to our fisheries section. But I want to speak not just to what is budgeted in our documents, Madam Speaker. I want to speak to also our thrust toward foreign direct investment. Because you see, Madam Speaker, in the area of fisheries, we have been in intense and deliberate discussions with private investors to build what will be considered the largest fish processing facility and fish farm in this part of the region, right here in our beautiful federation. What does that mean? Sagas and Weavers will be able to boast about being an exporter of fish and fish products. With the largest facility the region has ever seen. And this facility will come with its own feed manufacturing and its own packaging plant, which will greatly assist our local fisher folk in the packaging branding, and also the development of their own fish farms, significantly lowering the cost and improving the quality. So we're not just thinking about the investment for the investor's sake. We are looking at how that trickles down to the average man on the street, and the average fisher folk of our nation. Transformation indeed. So what I'm speaker. As we go on, I want to also talk about discussions that are ongoing with the Japanese government. Again, to strengthen our fishery sector, we have been discussing a project. And this project would be directed squarely at our own locals who wish to develop fish farms to be able to support them with the infrastructure and the training required to do so. And what this will do, Madam Speaker, 
is allow for our approach to foreign direct investment to be strengthened by our own domestic production by our locals by strengthening their facilities that they could sell into the major facility and then be able to move all products offshore to whoever so desires. But what does this do for our own local people? It means that the cost of food and the cost of fish will be significantly lowered because you know whenever there's anything in abundance price goes down. So again while we are all complaining about the high prices and I remember as I listened to my good friend and I would dare say my own inspiration sometimes when it comes to fashion the honorable member for Nevis 9 as he mentioned about the honorable leader's presentation and he mentioned that he did not hear any significant um, position on how we will address the challenges raised I said maybe when he was here when I speak he would understand part of what our mover would have positioned unfortunately we understand that he may not be able to hear me directly but he probably is hearing me from wherever he is but we do have an approach that directly addresses food security and maintaining our prices and lowering our prices in the midst of all the challenges we are facing globally because we cannot ignore the fact like he said many of the challenges are beyond our control but if we frame things properly if we put things into the right perspective and drive the production costs down while the output up we recognize that we can somehow balance and sustain ourselves and that is what we talk about transformation towards a sustainable island state so Madam Speaker yes as it relates to fisheries I think eh, we recognize that the money that we have budgeted is going to be put to excellent use where we can see those costs in supermarkets in St. and Nevis going down, irrespective of what is happening globally. And I think that deserves a bit of a wow. wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I want to also assure that our fisher folk recognize that we have not neglected them in the area of training. And so these projects would also assist in constant and improved training of our fisher folk. And also would allow us to increase the amount of fads that we place out in our waters to provide more grounds for our fisher folk to fish. Because you see, Madam Speaker, with the fads placed in our waters, our people have become accustomed to the Mai Mai's and the Tuna's and the Wahoo's and the likes. And we're falling in love with them. But to catch more of those, we need to go further out and we need these facts. And that is why, Madam Speaker, we are making this investment in more facts for our fisher folk so they have more grounds to fish, so that they can have bigger hauls and, of course, more money in their pockets. So I hear say, as it relates to the area and the Department of Fisheries and Marine Resources, the money budgeted will be well spent to ensure that our fisher folk can take advantage of the abundance of resource that exists in our blue economy. Now I'd like to take some time, Madam Speaker, to turn my attention to the Department of agriculture specifically. Now, in the Department of Agriculture, there is so much hope, so much prospect for the future. 
And that hope, Madam Speaker, is largely hinged to our effort toward climate smart agriculture. And I don't want to see us as just a fancy term, Madam Speaker. But you see, say kids and leaders, we are some together, what, 90? 100 square miles? They're about? 104. 104 square miles. Not enough land space to really project significant developments in our people, agriculture, industry, all at once. So we have to use that land smartly. And unlike trees, we can't grow more significantly. So we have to make sure that we assess the land well, construct proper usage of the land, and then attack that with diligence. So you see, climate smart agriculture affords us this opportunity. And so our thirst to getting deeper into climate smart agriculture, I believe will be a significant highlight of our 2023 budget. And I will get to more in depth about some of our approaches. But I also want to highlight our thoughts towards one of our major challenges that we've had. Because, Madam Speaker, you see, I have, at some point in my life, ventured and dabbled in a few other things. And one of which is audio engineering. And in my limited capacity there, I remember one session where the tutor mentioned sometimes to improve the quality of what you have, you have to look at reducing the problems before you think about adding anything else. So, with that approach, I've considered that in our approach to dealing with our friend and pests all at the same time, our monkeys. <laughs> For you see, while our monkeys are indeed part of our own product, tourism, our heritage. We have visitors that come to our shores and are happy to be part of the experience of petting and holding. Even BBC had done a documentary on our monkeys and their taste for alcohol. <laughs> but to our farmers, our monkeys represent a significant challenge. And that challenge, Madam Speaker, along with a few others, significantly hinders our ability to produce the type of food that our country requires to be self-sufficient. And so we are actively investing in a feral animal control program. And that program will not only see efforts to trap and so bring some measure of control to our monkeys, but also our wild pigs and other feral animals. How do we plan to execute? Madam Speaker, trapping is one part of it. But in the meantime, there's also the protection of our farm. And during my time campaigning, one of my commitment was to have all farms properly fenced. And so, Madam Speaker, we see our budget being able to give us the ability to not only fence farms with the wire fencing, but we are also investing in solar the solar capacity to create electrical fencing. And what does this do? For our ingenious monkeys, when they try to climb these fences, a little bit of a deterrent will be there waiting, powered by 
our green energy. And so, no matter where your farm is, be it at the top of Mount Lyamiga, or somewhere down in the valley, somewhere in a gut, that farm could be protected by solar-powered electrical fencing. And so, we see here again, Madam Speaker, monies budgeted will be well spent. Because if there's no monkeys to damage the fruit, it is believed that the output of fruit will be at least 40 to 50 percent higher. 40 to 50 percent higher. That is what is believed. So you see, right there and there, monies well spent. And so, outside of the trapping and the fencing, we want to also ensure that we put measures in place for long-term control. And so we have also been investing in the investigation on proper means of sterilization. Because you see, my understanding is that the monkey population is currently somewhere about three to five times that of the human population on the island. And the monkeys, I understand, can be a young ones twice a year. So you see, without proper sterilization efforts, we can find ourselves quickly in a serious Planet of the Apes issue. <laughs> So, Madam Speaker, I believe our efforts towards controlling feral animals will be money well spent. I also want to speak to another area in our budget that I believe has been challenging our agriculture sector for far too long, which is marketing. What I recognize, Madam Speaker, is that our Efforts towards marketing the produce of our local farmers have been a bit mm, lacking, Madam Speaker. And again, as a trained marketer myself, I am happy to have presented a plan to improve that capacity within the department and to have that plan supported by finance and this 2023 budget, Madam Speaker. So our plan will not only see improved access to the market, but also the development and construction of storage houses because that is another issue. When our farmers produce, what do we do with that produce? In the meantime, and getting it to market. How do we store that at the right temperatures to ensure that it is sustained for the longest shelf life that it has? And so storage will be something that we will invest heavy in in this 2023 budget. We also want to invest, Madam Speaker, in training. Because I was on the radio and I shared a simple bit of advice to our farmers. And I recognize, again, how much is lacking. Because a simple bit of advice in consistency was something that our farmers found illuminating. And I thought that would be something that would be common knowledge. That if you are consistent, it is easier to get a direct in in the market. And in that advice, I said to them, if you study the supermarket trend, supermarkets pack their shelves generally every Tuesday. And so if you have that produce every Tuesday, it's easy for a supermarket to say, hey, I need that produce to put on my shelf. The challenge has been that our farmers would have produce every three months. 
which does not work into the cycle of supermarkets or any cycle for that matter. Because I'm quite sure when you go, Madam Speaker, if you do, to your favorite restaurant and you ask for your favorite meal, you would hate for that attendant to tell you we won't have it until three months from now. And so our farmers should learn from that and recognize that they too cannot be producing every three months. And so training is indeed important with a drive towards consistency and a drive towards, of course, improved quality, which I must say our farmers have been doing quite a good job at the quality of produce. The consistency is where I think some lacking would be. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to take some time here to get back into climate smart agriculture. And in light of that, we have designed a wonderful project. And I must say, you know, I give some credit to my good friend and member opposite who would have started in his own way to install some greenhouses and we would have seen some improvement subtly in that approach. I also must give credit to the former Labour Administration who would have designed and built out a project of some, I understand, almost 30 plus greenhouses. But in studying all of these projects, Madam Speaker, I recognize a significant flaw. And that flaw is that our country now has some near 40 structures, but only four to seven actively growing. And so we've taken all of that knowledge and all of that data and formulated a plan. And that plan is to now create greenhouse villages, as we call it. And these greenhouse villages will see us building a series of greenhouse structures, complete with storage facilities, complete with technical support, water storage, and of course, green energy. And these structures will be then utilized by our farmers. And where this brings added benefit is that unlike in the past where these were placed on specific farms, and if that farmer had fell out of interest, then you can't do anything with that structure. If there's ever a day a farmer moves on into a different capacity, that structure could be reassigned to a new farmer. And the objective still met of productivity. Because at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, we are here for food and nutrition security, not just to have fancy structures. So again, our greenhouse villages are, for me, a wonderful idea that I am excited about for 2023 budget. And these villages, if there's any information that you may know about um, greenhouse and hydroponic farming as well, is that, one, it is water efficient, and so we'll be saving water by farming through this process. It is also space efficient. So we utilize less land space for more productivity. And it is also time efficient and, again, resilient against weather because the greenhouses now can withstand up to Category 5 storms. So imagine having a hurricane and the next day you're all selling produce. No longer do you have to go through rationing for weeks waiting for the seas to calm and a boat to return. Transformation 
is coming to agriculture. I think that deserves what? So, Madam Speaker, you see, there's a lot envisioned for our agriculture sector. And I've spoken on the production side of it from the raw material. But with all that new raw material, we have to then look into value added. Our value added capacity. And so, Madam Speaker, we are also investing in the improvement of our agro-processing unit. If we're talking about nutrition security, Madam Speaker, I've spent some time considering what were to happen in a worst case scenario. And for me, I believe we should not go backward ever because as an advanced society, we should always be thinking forward. And so, I've considered a number of crops, along with the department, that we think will work very well for agro-processing. And I'll share one such idea here. We considered breadfruit. And breadfruit is, in my opinion, a unique crop, because in its ripe state, it is a fruit. And it can do wonderful ice creams and desserts as a fruit. In its semi in its semi white state, it is both a wonderful vegetable but also a wonderful starch. And so, like potatoes, breadfruit can give you French fries or some virgin thereof. <laughs> Breadfruit can also be ground into flour. And while the world is projecting a shortage in wheat, corn, and some of the staple starches, we see we have a wonderful alternative in breadfruit. And so, we don't have to go without pasta, Madam Speaker, because the world is out of wheat. We can grind our breadfruit into flour and turn that flour into pasta and eat a more nutritious pasta dinner than we would have gotten buying it in the stores from overseas. So you see, all it takes is vision. All it takes is a new direction. A little bit of vigor. But with this new direction, Transformation is coming to agriculture. And so, Madam Speaker, without belaboring the point, I think we can all agree that under this administration, we could rest assured that if it's one thing we'll be able to do is eat in this country because agriculture is in good hands. I also want to speak briefly to the Department of Cooperatives, Madam Speaker. We are, for too long, the department has struggled a bit in a number of areas. You see, Madam Speaker, our cooperatives have not really had a space to operate, or places to operate, effectively. And as a country trying to develop this area, I think it is time that we invest more in assisting our cooperatives. And that is why we have allocated portions of our budget to upgrading some of our buildings that are under the control of agriculture to where our cooperatives can now have spaces to be able to operate. Again, money is well spent. When we understand the concept that cooperatives can really drive an economy towards success, we must strengthen that. 
and the lack of interest that we see in people joining our cooperatives. We do believe that our marketing thrusts, our training, and the efforts that we have budgeted for in this 2023 budget, we'll see a turnaround in that. And we'll see an increase in cooperatives, an increase in output, an increase of togetherness when it comes to our people working together. You know, it's sadly said that somehow our people don't know how to work together in partnership. And I am saying here now that I do believe that our efforts will change that narrative for the better. So, Madam Speaker, again I say agriculture, fisheries, marine resources and cooperatives, it's well budgeted and be monies well spent for the advancement and development of our food, nutrition, security, sinkets and nevis. But before I get off of that, I want to speak to a plant that we believe will be a driving force for 20, 23 and beyond. <laughs> Spark it. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I wish to make it clear to the world, as a Minister of Agriculture, that our country will take the establishment of a marijuana industry very, very seriously. In fact, Madam Speaker, I dare say that this conversation has been going on for far too long. I think it has been a promise for some three elections with no real delivery until now. So Madam Speaker, I would have liked to be in a very different position in this today, however, a few days difference may have permitted that. But I can dare say that my dear friend and colleague, the Attorney General, would agree that the work that we are doing in strengthening our legislations to address some of the issues raised by my friend and honorable member for Nevis 9 would put us in a place in 2023 to say that St. Kitts and Nevis is open for business as it relates to a, mari a marijuana industry. But you see, Madam Speaker, yes, and that deserves a while. Because in 2023, we will be open for business. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the marijuana industry, as we have heard, is a multi-billion dollar industry. And we have been dragging at a snail's pace in getting involved. And I could not understand for the life of me why. Literally growing money on trees. But yet somehow, <laughs> we don't want to participate. But I dare say, that era is over. And it's now a new day. And a better way. So in 2023, expect a vibrant, thriving marijuana industry. And for now, I leave it right there on marijuana. <laughs> but as we talk about industry and business, Madam Speaker, I'd like to move into another one of my ministries, which is the Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Madam Speaker, our overall goal within the Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship is to create a business environment where micro, small, medium enterprises can thrive. And I mean thrive and do very well. And so, Madam Speaker, the money is budgeted in our 2023 budget, some one million two hundred and ninety eight thousand four hundred and thirteen dollars is designed to create and strengthen initiatives post COVID-19 pandemic to deepen our recovery efforts to stimulate economic growth 
to aid development and increase employment among our people. Long and short, Madam Speaker, our aim here is to put money in people's pockets. At the end of the day, that is our aim. This is further strengthened by the $15 million that was placed into Development Bank for small business support. So you see, what has been designed is a mechanism and a vehicle that trains, prepares, and assists our young entrepreneurs to tap into funding. And then we are now directing them to all the available sources of funding. And to this end, beyond the Development Bank, I am pleased to say that a number of our other banks are considering soft loans for our entrepreneurs. And a number of other institutions, including some of our credit unions, are also considering this. So my ministry, the Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship, we recognize our, our responsibility in preparing our people to take advantage of all of these opportunities on the horizon. And I dare say that this ministry recognizes that it has a serious role to play amongst that group considered under the Alternative Lifestyle Program, or as it's popularly called, Peace Program. Because many of them, Madam Speaker, would have natural business acumen. We may not have agreed with how they would have utilized that acumen, but it's business acumen nonetheless. Imagine what happens when that natural instinct is harnessed and trained into a legitimate business. What you can get is a nation of very qualified and successful businessmen and women. And that is our goal as a Ministry of Entrepreneurship, Small Business Development. And so, to assist us along that goal, we recognize that we had to build a staff capacity to be able to offer significant training. And so our budget representation here is to assist in that regard. We are, our staff will now be ready and prepared to train our young entrepreneurs. But not just that, Madam Speaker. What you see in line in our budget here is that we had to bring that ministry closer to its market. Because to have a ministry tucked away in some corner of some building does not work if you're trying to attract the attention of the youth, the attention of our entrepreneurs, you have to be right in their face. And so we have sought a wonderful space for this ministry, Madam Speaker. A space that is easily accessible by all. And we have been looking to develop that space, Madam Speaker, into a one-stop shop right. for our business people where you can walk in, Madam Speaker, with just an idea and be guided all the way through to success. And at the end of it all, with monitoring and evaluation, have an excellent and successful business. I think that will do well for our nation. For you see, Madam Speaker, our small business sector, while ideas are abundant, has really suffered from lack of marketing. And so we will have that too. We will have, with the merger and the reconstruction of our ministry, we would have seen where they had small business development center tucked along with trade, and then another ministry 
with entrepreneurship and talent development tucked along somewhere else again. We have now brought all of this together, well structured and well designed. And so the resources that would have been previously branded on the moment will now be available to our entire small and micro, medium-sized business sector. And so our channel will promote our small businesses. SBDC's framework is now brought into that small business ministry. So what does that mean? It means that when I said on the campaign trail that we would offer concessions and tools of trade, it means now commitment made, commitment kept. As the Small Business Ministry will be offering concessions, tools of trade for medium, micro, small enterprises. So, again, money is well budgeted for small business and entrepreneurship. Now, Madam Speaker, I want to take some time and move on to another one of my departments. This department rests within the Ministry of Sports and the Creative Economy, and that is the Department of Sports. Now, Madam Speaker, I don't think there's any question that St. Kitts has been blessed. Blessed with phenomenal talent in the area of sports. St. Kitts, as small as we are, has produced a Kim Collins. St. Kitts and Nevis, I dare not forget our sister island, would have produced a number of top-tier cricketers, top-tier footballers, top-tier sportsmen and women in almost any field that we could imagine. And so, within the Ministry of Sports, or the Department of Sports, within the Ministry of Sports and the Creative Economy, I recognize that we had a task on our hands. Because when we evaluated the condition and the state that the Ministry of Sport was in, in taking office, we recognized some significant setbacks. One of such would have been the suspension of having our sports properly integrated into school curriculum. And I say that, while there is some, I say that reflecting on my years in school, where you know that come the first term, it's football season. And you're going to be playing football for months in the school's tournament. And then come early the second term, it is athletic season. And you're going to be preparing yourself for your school athletic meet on to into school and on to further field if you have the standard to meet. And then somewhere in between you have basketball season and all the other sports were coming. And for somehow some of that has been lacking. And so we have engaged in conversations with my good friend and colleague, uh, member for number one and the Minister of Education as to how we could properly reinstitute these activities back into our curriculum. Because you see, while we have set these lofty goals of having 20 and 24 CXC subjects, we cannot forget the importance of sport and an active lifestyle. And so we recognize that having been a challenge, that we had to address that challenge. And we have budgeted 
to address that challenge. And I'm happy to note that we have had the support of our Minister of Education. But, Madam Speaker, we have had other challenges. And we've seen challenges in the state of our sporting facilities, Madam Speaker. I've had a chance to visit a number of our facilities that is in serious disrepair. Now, if one could venture to our world-renowned track and field stadium, our Kim Collins Stadium, we'll see there's urgent need for upgrade. If we venture down to St. Paul's, we are... <laughs> we are, by some stroke of luck this year, and I won't speak to the luck, <laughs> They managed to pull off another victory and earn the, the cup. But their stadium desperately needs some attention. And I can agree to that statement. Champions really need champion stadium. That's why, that's why sports are in line. And so, to the request of my colleague and Member for number three, yes. Absolutely. There is room in this budget for the development. And I know you would like to refer to it as Champsville. Champsville. So I champs, <laughs> champions need champion Champsville. facilities. <laughs> and to the five-time champs in the town, only three teams in the final six. <laughs> <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, I am happy to note that we have budgeted for the upgrades for the Newtown playing field as well. And not to be left out, the Saddlers playing field, yeah. St. Mary's Pavilion, Connery playing field, and of course, within the constituency of constituency number four, we have also budgeted through our capital project for the development of the half a tree playing field. But as we talk about this budget, Madam Speaker, I don't want us to be pigeonholed into the concept that our development is entirely hinged on this. I am happy to note that we have been discussing other measures. And with the support of my wonderful Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, I do believe that we will see the upgrade of facilities all around the Federation including the facilities to the 2023 champions to be the All World United Jets. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, I have said what I have said. <laughs> but this is what it is all about, Madam Speaker. When you consider your budgets, you must consider the government's ability to spend but also consider the country's ability to attract foreign direct investment. And somehow you must find the right synergy between such and then be able to apply that to the nation's development. And I can happily say, as it relates to the Department of Sports, we have considered that all throughout. Of course, Madam Speaker, with wonderful facilities and an active youth program, we still need training. And so the gaps that we have in training, we have budgeted to facilitate that. 
where we can train our coaches, we can train our physiotherapists, we can train our nutritionists to be able to actively provide the right advice and technical support to our athletes. Because you see, it's not just about talent. We've been blessed with talent. But we must ensure that they're in proper physical strength, proper mental strength. And part of that has to do with their nutritional well-being. And so we must have training. And I'm happy to say that apart from our money's budgeted here, our good friends from the Republic of Cuba have also agreed to support in advanced training and education for the area of sports with the provision of some new scholarships as well. And I think that deserves a wow. So Madam Speaker, you can see that this, this is all well considered and well constructed. But with all of that consideration, I think it would be remiss of me if I don't inject here the power of inspiration. And I say the power of inspiration because I know what it was like as a young aspiring artist when I was able to sit in and, and stand in the crowd of a music festival and watch some of my idols perform. And so with that memory, I have recognized what that would mean for our sportsmen and women. And so we have also budgeted to invest in sports tourism in collaboration with my dear friend and colleague, member for number two. And so we have already, yes, the CPL, which we have done and will continue to do. But what we have endeavored to do is ensure that we allocate the right budget to the right areas and construct these contracts properly. Because truth be told, Madam Speaker, I have had a number of sleepless nights and headaches with some of the contracts that were inherited from the past. But I'm happy to say that we have weathered those storms and we are now prepared for 2023's edition. And with that, you would see that we have properly allocated in the budget to take care of that. But along with items like CPL, there are a number of other measures that we have budgeted for when it comes to sports tourism. We are looking forward to wonderful events in the area of volleyball. We are looking forward to more cricket coming to our shores. And indeed, basketball and football are also on the agenda for 2023. Madam Speaker, I am sure that after your comment here, the Netball Association will be happy <laughs> to engage and bring some international tournaments as well. <laughs> so you see, in considering the budget, we wanted to take a very holistic approach where we inspire, where we facilitate youthful development, where we facilitate proper facilities, and we facilitate education and wrap that all into a very powerful approach to drive the sport sector forward. That doesn't require a great deal of creativity, in my opinion. However, that gives me a chance to talk about the creative economy for a bit. Madam Speaker, when we took office, we recognized that a lot of our cultural aspects and entertainment aspects and were really all over the place. Madam Speaker, we recognized that you had 
a department of culture that had a mandate to develop culture, the performing arts, and, and, and certain aspect of our entertainment sector. And that same mandate was also given to a department of entertainment and talent development. And so we've seen areas where the Department of Culture was developing a database, and the Department of Entertainment was develop developing the same database, but no cohesion between the two. And we recognized then that this was not sustainable. So what we did as a cabinet was to decide upon a merger of all those elements that catered to our creative sector and create a wonderful area and department called the creative economy. And under that creative economy, we pulled the departments of culture, the departments of entertainment and talent development, which incorporated festivals and the likes into one space. So now all efforts are moving in one direction. All efforts are moving cohesively. All efforts are made to ensure that this sector has the fullest and undivided and unobstructed attention. And so on the heels of that creation, we appointed a director to the creative economy. And Madam Speaker, this director happens to be just about the youngest director in our government. And I remember being questioned and almost, in some cases, I wouldn't say chastised, but, you know, some people didn't think too favorably of the appointment. Looking at her age, Persons did not believe in her capability. But I am not one to believe that a young woman is incapable. And so I followed through with that appointment. And I sat happily at the opening of Canada. When everyone who had questions and doubts was able to say, this was the best we have ever seen. And that was, to a large measure, the master plan of this director. And she deserves a wow. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, under the directorship, and the care of the Ministry of Sports and the Creative Economy, we have sought to address some of the needs and bring some of the challenges that our creative sector face to a minimum. And this budget is designed to help us do just that. For you see, we recognize, Madam Speaker, that training and education has been for too long part of what that sector has lacked. We recognize that what we have developed over the years here is what I term an inverted pyramid. We are, a pyramid should be pointed at the top with a wide base. And that brings, of course, stability, Madam Speaker. But what we have seen in this creative sector locally over the years is an inverted pyramid where you have a wide pool of talent at the top and supporting infrastructure at a narrow point at the bottom. So we have a great deal of artists and entertainers and, and talent, but very few people who understand how to manage. Very few people who understand intellectual property. Very few people who understand how to push that talent further afield. And so it has really held our creative sector in a position where it's almost toppling. 
it is unstable. And so we've seen for too many years artists rise, spend a few years in local acclaim, and then after some time they are almost with our way. And I am saying here, Madam Speaker, that our construct of this budget will assist, Madam Speaker, in being able to train our people in the area of entertainment business. It will be able to train our people about intellectual property, train our people about artistic management, train our people about all the areas behind the scenes in artistic development, so that our front um, runners, our artists and, and our performers, will have the proper supporting mechanisms that will bring them to a point that they could not only have that great deal of local acclaim, but also that international acclaim that they so well deserve. Because a Dejour, Byron Messiah, Infamous, Highlight, is just as good as any artist you've seen worldwide. What they lack, Madam Speaker, is that support. And so we are here preparing to train that support so that it doesn't have to be important, Madam Speaker. But when that support comes forward, it comes forward with a tag saying, produced in St. Kitts. And that is important. And this budget, Madam Speaker, helps us to address that effectively. But Madam, Madam Speaker, Beyond just that support, we also recognize that we have to have consistent outlets for our creatives. Our creatives need spaces where they can be themselves. Because we recognize and we know that the mind of a creative person operates very differently to the mind of a corporate person. And they don't always feel as welcome and comfortable in our corporate spaces. And we need to provide spaces for our creative. You know, I always think about history. And when I think about the past, and you go venturing in history, one of the things that I often find amusing, I hear less about who was a politician of the time. When I talk about a Michelangelo, they talk about the poets and the painters and the artisans of the time. So is the importance of our creative sector. What will people talk about our country a hundred years from now? Will it not be what we have been able to create? Will it not be what we have been able to do and etch into the minds? Will it not be our music? Will it not be our art? Like one song. Like one song. is finished. And so many other pieces. You know, I had the opportunity to unveil a painting in the honor of the great Kenneth Georges the person who composed our national anthem. And if nothing else, we remember Kendrick George's fall is the creation of that wonderful art piece that we stand proudly at all events in honor of our country. So art is indeed important, Madam Speaker, and we stand ready to support that with this budget. Madam Speaker, as I talk about the creative economy and as I almost come to closing that area of the discussion, I want to not leave out the wider element of culture 
Because, Madam Speaker, culture embraces so much more than just the performing arts and the talent. But we know that we also have a great deal of heritage. Um, having a World Heritage Site in the Brimstone Hill Fortress and National Park, and a number of other um, world renowned sites between the Federation and both countries. And I'm happy to Honorable say member. that. Honorable Member, you have 15 minutes left for your allotted time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. All right, then, <laughs> Madam Speaker. I have the support for her. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, as we look at our cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, we have also budgeted for the support and development of both the tangible cultural heritage and the intangible cultural heritage. Because, Madam Speaker, while we can speak to wonderful fortresses and um, the iconic features of, say, Independence Square, Berkeley Memorial. There are some other attributes that we pay less attention to that are of significant, significant importance. I remember, Madam Speaker, growing up every Christmas, you can be sure to see Jawela walking around with his long brooms that you could use to clean your roof, made from the straw of palm trees. That, Madam Speaker, is a skill that we must hold on to, that we must nurture, develop, and pass along. And so the Department of Culture has budgeted to preserve skills like that and many others. You know, our confectionaries, we, we I mean, we do a wonderful post, um, set of jams in this country, sugar cakes, and so many other things. How are we preserving all of this, Madam Speaker? And the Department of Culture is set to move forward in preservation of our cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible. And this budget allows us to do exactly that. So again, money well spent on the area of sports and the creative economy. But let me wrap that section up, Madam Speaker, because as you indicated, I am winding down on my time, which I will. But I want to end that conversation on sports and the creative economy speaking to our national carnival. Sugar Mass 51 has, Madam Speaker, by all accounts, been quite a success. We have had a successful opening ceremony, Madam Speaker. We have had a successful series of events within the spirit of Christmas, Madam Speaker. We have had a successful Junior Calypso Monarch um, event, Madam Speaker, where we started crown going to Princess Nevia, <laughs> who coincidentally, Madam Speaker, was from Nevis. <laughs> and I now understand from the constituency. Um, <laughs> But Madam Speaker, it is inspiring to see that these traditionally male-dominated events are now seeing the emergence of more women taking the helm. And so the Junior Calypso Monarch, being a woman and being from Nevis, is pleasing. Congratulations to <laughs> Another area of success which I wish to highlight here, now that I have this platform, Madam Speaker, is the support that our National Carnival has received from corporate St. Kitts, Nevis. And for me, when I look at what has happened there, 
I deem it to be special indeed. Because, Madam Speaker, for the first time ever this year, all local telecom providers have decided to put the competitive spirit aside and join hands with the National Carnival Committee in supporting our people, in supporting our culture, in supporting our heritage. And I think that is quite commendable to see coming out of a pandemic. They have all recognized that this competitive rivalry that we've held on for so long to has no place in the celebration of arts, culture, and our people. And they have all agreed to come on as top tier sponsors this year. And I want to commend them and say thank you. First time in history. And so, Madam Speaker, I hear say here that while this carnival has been particularly challenging, given the short time that we've had to prepare for it, having come into office just in October, right into CPL, right into Independence, and, so, so, uh, August, sorry, right into CPL and then Independence Celebration and the likes, we have managed to pull off phenomenal feet. But when you compound that matter with supply chain issues, and all the different global activities that have really been challenging the execution of this carnival. I believe it is fair to say that this federal cabinet, that the Ministry of the Creative Economy, and that the Carnival Committee deserves all the praise for pulling off what we have seen to date. Because I tell you, and I kid you not, the challenges are great. But somehow, with the support of the cabinet, because when I had to go back to the cabinet and ask for additional um, resources to ensure that we could meet the needs, and then the chairperson had to find a way to satisfy all the practitioners. You see, People see the end result, but they don't understand what happens behind that. And so I want to lend my own voice in saying how much I appreciate all the work that has been done and all the support granted for this year's National Carnival event by all the cabinet, the ministries, and the Carnival Committee, and corporate sinkers as well. Thank you all. And I want to register that here, utilizing this platform. So, Madam Speaker, allow me here and now, before my initial time is up. Okay. And I am, I am here now requesting additional time if I am allowed to do so so early, but when the time is up, well, I am, yes. <laughs> Putting it down that. This year's carnival had a theme early that you should be here. And I don't think people really understood what it meant. That was until they saw the opening ceremony and the unveiling of Wonderland. And I want to take this time here now to say to all of us here, make sure that you are there enjoying the rest of our national carnival and all the events. And I have done my best to ensure that all of you received your packages today. So that you have no excuses now. And you are to be there. But I also want to send a welcome to the wider community. To all locals living at home and abroad. And say, you need to be here. Because Sugar Mass 51 is going down on record as the best carnival Sankis and Nevis has had in its history. So Madam Speaker, given all that detail, could you imagine what Sugar Mass 52 will be like, given more time and more resources? I think we are in for, for a very, very phenomenal one, Madam Speaker. And while I still have some time, Madam Speaker, 
I want to turn my attention to the efforts of the wider government, Madam Speaker, but the efforts particularly as it addresses my own constituency, constituency number four. Because as I listen to the mover and prime minister, I was very pleased to know that the people of constituency number four will benefit from improved housing. And so I want to thank Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, as well as the minister responsible for housing, for their own commitment towards that development. And I want to say here and now to constituency number four, look forward to Quality Homes 2023. This budget is indeed transformational. Madam Speaker, I also was delighted to hear the conversation about roads, which is a very pressing matter within the constituency. And so, hearing the Honorable Mover of the bill discuss the plans budgeted for roads, I now know that constituency four will be well taken care of. And again, so stone for tendering is already out. Thank you so much, honorable member for number three, for your commitment to delivering quality roads to our people. And this is what I'm talking about. This is a wonderful effort. And I dare say, I don't think this parliament and this country has seen a greater display of collaboration and I dare to use the word unity. Never before have you seen a greater display of unity. Collaboration. Partnership. But you've never, but that's what I'm saying. You've never before seen a greater expression of it. <laughs> and so when our honorable member for number two speaks I'm quite sure she will speak to what our honorable mover would have projected in his own presentation about increased tourism and I'm happy to note that somewhere between the beginning of my constituency and I like to claim at the end, the foot of Brimstone Hill, it is recorded that some 80% of our visitors venture between. So my constituency sees 80% of the tourists that comes to this country. So any increase in tourism means more business, more money in the pockets of the people of constituency four. So thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, and thank you, Honorable Member, for number two. <laughs> and as I heard about our drive for investment, I do hope to see some investment in constituency number four in this period. And I have been hearing about talks of a hotel in constituency number four. And I'm looking forward to that in the area of investment. So again, we see a well-crafted budget, and for me, how this budget benefits my people. But I also want to touch on an area and a new ministry that was also framed and talk about the care for the most vulnerable and differently abled in constituency number four. And in that regard, I would like to say that, you know, this budget also allows for greater care for these constituents. And I am indeed happy for that. Because I did a tour with the Minister responsible for Aging and Disabilities. And we visited those homebound persons in the constituency that were um, either wheelchair bound or just could not readily leave their homes. 
And I am happy to know that in 2023, more help, more assistance, more support will be given to these constituents because I hold them at a very dear place in my heart, Madam Speaker. So thank you, Minister Responsible. Thank you, Honorable Senator, for your care, your effort, and your support for those differently able. Thank you. Honorable Member, that is your time. May I have, may I request an additional 30 minutes? The Honorable Member for St. Christopher Four has requested additional time. Is those in favor? Aye. Those against? Honorable Member, you may proceed. 30 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I won't exhaust that 30 minutes. <laughs> well, Madam Speaker, there's another area that I am also pleased and I look forward to. And I spoke to it in my presentation, which is the development of the marijuana industry. And so I want to really give credit to the Honorable AG, and the Honorable Prime Minister for the efforts that uh, would have been put into that development. Because you see, Madam Speaker, I come from a farming community. Constituency 4 is quite talented in farming. And I believe that talent will do well with such an industry. And I believe that they are waiting for the launch of that industry to really take shape and put their talents to work in a more meaningful and positive way. And so I am excited about what 2023 holds for the farmers in constituency number four. Thank you. Thank you, AG. Thank you. And as I begin to wrap up, Madam Speaker, <laughs> I also want to take this time to wish all my constituents a joyous season and a prosperous 2023. I want to also take the time to wish everyone here a wonderful season and a prosperous 2023. And I'm not just wishing that by words. I am wishing that because we have put together a wonderful budget to ensure that 2023 is indeed prosperous and much better than 2022 has been. And so in conclusion, <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> it is clear to see that the work under the ministries of agriculture, fisheries, marine resources and cooperatives, sports and the creative economy, and small business and entrepreneurship will be accomplished on the principles of public and private partnership and collaboration innovation, capacity building, people empowerment, accountability, transparency, and inclusion. And these will be our guiding lights to ensure that our fiscal and strategic plans are executed well with the widest reach and most responsible management and use of our state resources. Simply put, we will ensure that the public's money is well spent by our actions. May it please you, Madam Speaker.